Good evening, Soundhouse Church. Today is Good Friday, and it's a unique service for us because it's one of our few evening services that we do. But usually, we're meeting in a park at Marine Stadium, and we're chasing after our kids on the grass. I'm crossing my fingers that my kids don't stand up and run around in the middle of the message, that I brought enough snacks for them. We're huddled together because we never remember how cold Marine Stadium Park actually is. And then we have this moment where we take communion together as a church family. We anticipate the Easter egg hunt that's happening the next day. I usually find a few more face painters who can help me. And then we talk about Easter Sunday morning. Growing up in the church, who um, I had parents who were heavily involved in ministry. Busy Easter seasons are all I've ever known. Stuffing thousands of Easter eggs, spending countless days and hours in a row at church is what I've equated Easter to. But this year is unique. We can't meet together in person. There's no big egg hunt. And so we have this unique opportunity to be in your homes tonight. So thank you for inviting us in there. I'm going to challenge you tonight to take the next few moments to really dial in and really sit and listen to this message without distractions. So if you can put down your phone, you can turn off the light, grab a Bible. I want you to use the best visual, uh, visualization tools that you have and really think about the weight of this story. Just sit in it for the next few moments. I'm going to tell you the story about the greatest sacrifice that was ever made. It's a story that really begins at the beginning of the Bible with Adam and Eve when they first made that choice to sin. It's interwoven throughout the whole story of the Bible, and it comes to this exciting moment that is today, that's Good Friday, when Jesus actually paid the ultimate price for our sins on the cross. So I'm going to pick up 
during Passover week. Jesus and his disciples shared the Last Supper meal together. He taught them a new commandment to love each other as he has loved them. He washes their feet. After the meal is over, he's um, anticipating his death, his resurrection. He's even um, telling one of his disciples that they're going to ultimately betray him. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane where they pray, and that's where ultimately he's betrayed and arrested. He's then brought in front of the high priest and ultimately Pilate to be tried. We're going to pick up the story in John 19, 1 through 6. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. And the Jews continue to insist upon crucifying Jesus. They vote to have a different prisoner released, and ultimately Pilate gives in and hands over Jesus to them. The soldiers took Jesus, carrying his own cross, to Golgotha, where he would ultimately be crucified. They nailed him to a cross between two other men and placed a sign above his head that read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, since that was the only charge that Pilate could find against him. The soldiers mocked him, and they cast lots for his clothing. They nailed his hands and feet to the cross. Picking up the story in John 19, 28 through 30. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It's a story that maybe you've read time and time again. I've read time and time again. And as I was preparing for this message, I was surprised almost that it's so short. The crucifixion, the details of the flogging, of Jesus being beaten, there's not much there. And as I was digging into it, I was realizing um, that I don't know much about the historical significance of the crucifixion. I know about his hands and feet being nailed, but it's hard to really picture what that's like because it's not part of our daily lives. So some historical context on crucifixion. I did some research. This is not the most fun topic to research. It's kind of dark. But um, crucifixion actually started back in the Persians in 200 to 300 BC, and it was one of the most excruciatingly painful forms of execution. The Latin word of crucifixion actually has a lot of ties to the word excruciating, and the commentaries say in the Bible that the reason why there's not a lot of explanation as to what, what crucifixion really looked like is because it was commonplace knowledge that if someone was crucified, it was so excruciatingly painful that they didn't need to go into any of the details. So before crucifixion, men, like Jesus was, was often flogged. And flogging is when they took long strips of leather and they attached metal and pieces of bone to it, and they would use that to whip the victims. And in Jewish law, they had a um, law that you could only strike someone 40 times, but the Romans had no such law. And so ultimately, as they would start beating them, one man on each, one man on each side in the middle of the person who was being flogged, they would start to tear up skin, they would start to tear up veins, and ultimately get down to arteries. So after Jesus was flogged, as if that wasn't enough, he had a crown of thorns placed on his head. Now, our head is a very vascular and very sensitive area. So, again, more bleeding, more suffering. From then, they are forced to carry their cross to the crucifixion site. And they usually took the longest road possible. So, 30 to 40 pounds on their back of wood or whatever the cross, there's various shapes of them, um, up to the crucifixion site, which was outside of the city. They were kind of paraded through the city as a signed to others as an example um, of certainly something that you did not want to be doing. And so I think I don't like to read that part of the Bible. That's uncomfortable for me to think about all of those things. And I often have glossed over those gory details. I really like Easter Sunday morning when Jesus 
raises from the dead, and everything's white and beautiful, and my sins are washed away. But thinking about Good Friday is hard. And thinking about someone doing all of that for me and for my sins and for you and for your sins is uncomfortable. I can't pay that back. I didn't do anything to deserve it. And so I think when I read it and I really make myself sit in that, it just feels heavy. I feel the weight of it. When I was growing up, I went to an elementary school that um, was affiliated with a church um, that used to put on the passion play, The Glory of Easter. And in this representation of Easter, there was Roman soldiers riding in on their um, horses. There was flying angels, Pilate and Herod, and tigers and fire. And it was a visual representation of what Easter might have been like. But I will never forget this one moment in the show when all the lights went dark in the whole cathedral. And it was when they were hammering Jesus to the cross in his hands, or some people say his wrists. And I just remember the echoing of the noise of the hammer and the nails going in. And it's something that I will never forget. A few years ago, not being able to see that show anymore, I felt like I was missing the weight of what really happened on Good Friday. And so I started making myself watch The Passion of the Christ. Not as punishment, but I think sometimes I don't like to think about that. And again, it's hard for me to visualize. So making myself watch that movie reminded me of maybe some of the sights and sounds that might have happened that day on the cross. It usually leaves me speechless. Um, It's hard to fathom a sacrifice that was so great and a gift that was so grand. Interestingly enough, as I was reading through the story of the crucifixion, there was one group of people who were there witnessing Jesus be crucified who dared to stay and watch. So I'm going to read in Luke 23, 49, it explains, But all who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. And in John 19.25, it explains in more detail that these women were Mary, his mother, probably his aunt, and then also Mary Magdalene. Now, these women, his mom specifically, was there since he was born. She witnessed the miracle of his birth. They saw him heal the sick. They saw him teach to thousands. They saw him perform amazing miracles throughout his teaching ministry. And here they were watching one of the darkest moments in history, and they didn't look away. They stayed for that really hard moment. And sometimes I wonder if there's something significant there. Are we willing to stay in those hard moments? And when we do, what happens when we remain at the foot of the cross? What happens if I let myself feel all those feelings? How much greater is Easter morning knowing what that Good Friday sacrifice really was? The gravity of what happened on the cross, in addition to that never-ending love and eternal life, is something that I know I shouldn't gloss over. So as I reread the crucifixion story, there's one part that, well, there's a few parts that make me very mad, but specifically, I always come up with this idea that it feels very unjust. It wasn't fair. He didn't deserve it. Even the part that I read earlier where Pilate again and again and again says, this man is innocent. I don't find any guilt in him. Frustrates me because I feel like it didn't have to be that way. But then we're reminded in scripture over and over and over again that Jesus did this willingly. He did it as a gift. He chose to lay down his life. Doesn't say that they chose to kill him. He did it willingly. He went to the cross knowing that this is kind of what he had signed up for. He chose to suffer, to die, and to rise again so that we could live in freedom, so that we could be forgiven and spend eternity with him forever. Can you feel the weight and the sacrifice of that gift? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So the cost of our sin is death. And we aren't having to pay that price. That's heavy. But that's also a story that's filled with hope. Because the second part of the verse says, the free gift, it does not cost us anything. It's given to us as a gift, and it's eternal life in Jesus Christ. John Piper wrote an Easter devotional book called Love to the Uttermost. And he says this quote, which I really like. This is the center of the gospel. This is what the Garden of Gethsemane and Good Friday are all about that God has done astonishing and costly things to draw us near. He sent his son to suffer 
and to die, so that through him we might draw near. It's all so that we might draw near. And all of this is for our joy and his glory. He goes on to say, this drawing near is not a physical act. It's not building a Tower of Babel by your achievements to get to heaven. It's not necessarily going into a church building. That's good for us right now, maybe. We're not walking to an altar at the front. It's an invisible act of the heart. You can do it while standing absolutely still. You can do it while laying in a hospital bed or while sitting in a pew listening to a sermon. Drawing near is not moving from one place to another. It's directing your heart into the presence of, of God, into the presence of God, who is as distant as the holy of holies in heaven and yet as near as the door of faith. He's commanding us to come, to approach him, and to draw near. And so tonight, I just want to take a moment to sit at the foot of the cross. This is not something I do often. I don't think it's something that only has to happen on Good Friday. But will you just sit with me just for a moment and feel the weight of what he did? Will you take a moment just to visualize what that looked like? So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Can you picture it? Can you picture Jesus up there after all the torture that he had been through? Do you see the nails? Can you imagine your sins on his shoulders? Refuse to look away. Sit in that humble spot. Draw near to him and reflect on the significance of Jesus having nails hammered through his hands and feet, being mocked, beaten, spit on, humiliated, and doing it all for you willingly as a gift of eternal life for me and you. Don't lose sight of this moment. The foot of the cross is a place that we should visit often. And when I sit in this moment, I, I feel so much sadness, I feel ashamed, and yet I am ultimately so grateful for this gift. Because the gift is not about anything we did or could ever do. The gift is about us opening our hands and receiving it and placing our burdens on Jesus, who chose to take those sins away from us. He chose to wash this away. I want to be like these women who refuse to look away. I want to draw near. And when I sit at the foot of the cross, all I think is gratitude. I want to thank him. How will you respond to sitting at the foot of the cross? You can open your eyes if you haven't already. I hope that this Good Friday that you'll accept the freedom of that gift, that you'll choose to give him the glory and the honor and the praise. I hope that you will know that this sacrifice and this gift and the weight of what happened on Good Friday is not the end of the story. Jesus dying on the cross is not the grand finale. There's a saying that it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And I think in order to understand the beauty of Sunday morning, of Easter, is to really understand what happened on Good Friday. The, the stories work hand in hand. Easter and Good Friday are a reminder that he is alive, we should rejoice, and that because he lives, we have a reason to face tomorrow. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. Those words just don't even feel enough for what you went through on the cross. We are just overwhelmed at the physical pain that you endured for us, at the sacrifice that you made, that you chose to do that as a gift for us. And so I just pray that you would soften our hearts to receive that, Lord, that we would just sit at the foot of your cross tonight, that we would just feel the weight of what happened that night, that we would have gratitude in our hearts and that we would anxiously await Easter Sunday morning, knowing the story continues and that it continues in each of us. I pray that we would continue to just live our lives bringing glory to you in gratitude for this gift that you've chosen to give us. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We hope that we will see you back on Easter Sunday morning. Ryan and Chad will be doing a virtual courtyard chat starting at 9.50, and then we'll have our Easter service message and worship starting at 10 a.m. We hope to see you there.